Hello and welcome to Guiding Assets, the flagship investment podcast for CFA Institute. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with two members of CFA Institute's Brain Trust. Rodri Priest, CFA, is Senior Head of Research, responsible for heading the global research activities and publications of CFA Institute, and Ryan Munson is a research manager on that team. They were good enough to talk to me today about a report that the Institute published this summer, which maps out four potential scenarios for the investment industry over the coming years. As co-authors of The Future State of the Investment Industry, along with a handful of others, they're uniquely positioned to speak to the report's findings. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks, Mike. Good to be here. Thanks, Pat. Rodri, could you take me through the goals of the report? And Ryan, maybe you could speak to how you went about doing the research for it. Sure. Well, this report is really an attempt to lay out the major trends and sources of disruption affecting the investment industry and to then try and translate those trends and disruptors into some key scenarios that we see playing out and shaping firms' business models, investment processes, and the like over the forward-looking five to 10-year horizon. And it's actually a reprisal of some work that we first conducted around six years ago that was then called, at the time, the future state of the investment profession. Six years on from that exercise, clearly the world has, has changed pretty dramatically in a number of ways. And we felt that that provided an opportune moment to revisit some of the assumptions around that original work, revise our framework around the trends and disruptors shaping the industry, and lay out a new path forward to help firms, professionals, and industry leaders navigate the changes ahead and make sure that they can deliver good client outcomes for their investors. That's great. I really would love to circle back to look at what that original report back in 2017 had. But in the meantime, let's get started with just looking at where the data came from. So Ryan, can you talk to that? Like, What's the source of the data for this report? For this report, we started with qualitative feedback from our CFA Institute Research and Policy Center Advisory Council. There are industry luminaries who really have their pulse on the figure on the pulse of what's going on in the industry today. And we use their insights to formulate a questionnaire, which we distributed to our CFA Institute membership. So we had over 3,000 responses to that survey, which was distributed in late 2022. And so those two combined pieces of feedback, the qualitative feedback and the survey report itself, led us to kind of build these scenarios, identify the key factors that were going to be impacting the industry in the next five to 10 years. So as I understand it, you had sort of four main scenarios that, that came out of that work, but what folks figured might transpire in the markets in the coming years there. So Rodri, maybe I'll go to you for the first two. I understand they're the end of cheap money and sustainable finance. What did investors foresee happening under these scenarios and what should practitioners be doing to stay on the right side of these trends? Yeah. So let's first talk about sustainable finance. So this really is our way of articulating what we see as a, a major shift that's been playing out over a few years now and how that will then shape your business models and, and investment decision making going forward. One of the mega trends that we cite in the report is climate change and environmental degradation. The here and now of this issue, it's risen to the top of the corporate and political agenda. And whatever your views are of that topic, we think it's important that industry leaders find a way to navigate the political and social pressures that come with talking about climate change and, and biodiversity loss and so forth, and, and map that really into what does that mean as an investment professional? What does that mean for investment products and investment strategies? And so here we really talk about how do firms kind of navigate the, these issues, think about sustainability holistically, to think about risks and opportunities to think about systemic issues that could potentially come from climate change, where you know, essentially the marketplace can be exposed to systemic shocks that can affect all investments coming from significant changes to, to climate and, and natural resources. And so how do you position your portfolios for these potential outcomes? And given that they manifest only over you know, several decades, you know, risk modeling and scenario modeling when it comes to climate change is a challenge. So I think that's one of the first points that we want to speak to in this report, the need to embrace systems thinking, to understand reflexivity, to understand investments in the context of the wider ecosystem in which corporate value is created, and then also to be responsive to the social and political pressures that come with navigating the need to be more 
conscious around sustainability goals and objectives. It also plays into where we see the growing demand for, for personalized products. And I think that's something that what we can talk about in some of the other scenarios, but this issue of product personalization is one of the, the big themes that comes out throughout the narratives that we set out in this report. And in the sustainable finance area, um, one of the trends that we have seen in recent years is, is this demand from some retail investors for kind of thematic investments that, that allow you to capitalize on sustainability themes like clean energy, for example, new technologies that cater to the green transition and so on. So sustainability certainly plays into thematic portfolios and the personalization quite. The final thing I would say around sustainable finance is in order to really engage and tackle some of these intractable challenges that will come with the push towards decarbonization in accordance with, with net zero goals is the need to embrace coalitions. So to partner with like-minded organizations to advocate for change and, and effective solutions that can really serve the industry and its and its client base well. So the second big scenario in this report that we want to speak to is what we call the end of cheap money. So you know, quite different from the discussion on sustainable finance, this scenario is really about the, the macroeconomic regime change that we've seen unfold, particularly since the post-pandemic, but it really goes back some years before that to you know around about 2016, 2017, when we saw really this this sort of shift from a world in which globalization was the driving force with integrated supply chains, low inflation, low interest rate, and lower for longer environments, if you like, to one in which we started to see some um, political fracturing, political polarization, rising geoeconomic competition. That trend has really increased in the years since the pandemic. Now we see the world fracturing into these different economic zones. There's certainly a push to reduce reliance on overseas supply chain supply chains that had a, an inflationary impulse that central banks are having to respond to and have been responding to since 2022. And we are by no means at the end of that cycle just yet. So how the industry grapples with this new regime of higher and more variable nominal interest rate, higher inflation, clearly one of the major macro themes that the investment industry is having to navigate. And what comes out of that, we think, is firstly, resurgent demand for traditional products like money market funds that are offering higher yields to relatively safe instruments that offer better returns compared to what was in place prior to the pandemic. We also see resurgent demand for inflation protection instruments, but also active management as well. I think one of the big trends that we saw in the period sort of since the financial crisis up until the, about the time that the the, of the onset of the pandemic was the market performing very well, backed up by central bank abundant liquidity, low interest rates, the sort of the, the tide that lifted all boats, if you like. And simply having exposure to the market, having that beta exposure was a good way to invest and in decent returns. In this more kind of higher, more variable inflation and interest rate environments, we think that it'll be important to have some proportion of your assets actively managed, that there are now more opportunities for good active managers to demonstrate their value, where we see wider dispersion in asset returns, less correlation across asset classes. And that certainly creates more interesting conditions, I think, for active managers to succeed in this new environment. So certainly, you know, active management is, is one of the, the narratives that comes out of this end of cheap money scenario. Yeah, I know. And in the report, you're quoted as saying the last decade was about beta. The next decade, the next decade will be about alpha. Right, and I, I think that's that's just an, a nice way, a shorthand way of, of alluding to this in, this need to really focus on alpha in in a challenging market environment where there is high volatility, where having beta exposure can lead to some some mark drawdowns in your portfolio. So how you think about alpha, how you think about ma mitigating your downside risk and extracting value where possible just becomes even more important in this new environment. Yeah, and what you were describing at the outset there is the respondents are really looking through the, doesn't feel like short-term inflation surges, but it feels it's been on for 18 months or more now, but you know they're looking through the, the current inflationary environment and talk, what they're really talking about is higher real rates over the longer term. Yeah, that that's right. I mean, I think a big question of this end of cheap money scenario is, you know, where is the future headed when it comes to, to real interest rates? You know, do we think that real rates will revert back to this pre-pandemic era where 
you know, essentially you had very low inflation, very low nominal interest rates. You know, what's kind of like the equilibrium level of the natural rate of interest? And that's a big question that policymakers are grappling. It's not one that I'm going to, going to attempt to answer on this podcast, but it's really a fundamental issue that I think professionals need to be thinking about because it really governs capital market expectations and therefore asset allocation decisions as well. But, you know, I think how we want to try and help people to think about those issues is just to lay out the structural shifts that are underpinning this regime change to one in which inflation interest rates will be more variable and generally higher than in the period that preceded the pandemic. Yeah, wherever they are, they're not going to be, you know, half a percent or, or negative for, for sure. Right. It's funny, actually, I was uh, I was talking to a colleague the other day who, was, who had pulled out a, a printout, a hard copy of an old presentation he'd given. He's an institutional portfolio manager. He was looking at, I think it was 15 or so years ago, maybe a little longer than that. And and the the, the topic of the slide was these unusually low rates at like three and a half percent of of real rates. He's like, this is this won't persist at these low rates. So, yeah, you forget sometimes uh, for folks, especially that haven't been in the industry that long, that uh, the ten years of 2010 to 2022 call it is not the norm. So, anyways, I'll uh, I'll, I'll leave it there, uh, Ryan. Maybe I, uh, we can turn to you, and you might be able to take us through the other two uh, sort of scenarios that may play out in the next uh, five to ten years. Absolutely. The first scenario that I have to cover is diverging worlds. So that scenario is really about how divides are widening across a variety of factors that will have an impact on how people engage with the investment management industry. So thinking about things like demographics, individual belief systems, socioeconomic status, all those factors are becoming more of a point of polarization in today's society. And so all of those things are going to have their own individual impact on the investment management industry. And so we see those things coming to the fore through means of, as Roger just mentioned, deglobalization. So we're going to be seeing some potentially more troubling times for emerging economies as our respondents felt that deglobalization was going to be more impactful or have a larger impact on those emerging economies, whereas existing economic powers are more shielded and they're shielded due to their size and their stability. They're more better situated to weather volatility that the market may throw at them. There'll also be a resurgence in domestic manufacturing. So the disruption of supply chains around the COVID pandemic just further drove that, drove, drove that spike into these supply chain pressures and it kind of moved us away from the just-in-time manufacturing model that we have become so accustomed to. Another factor on the deglobalization front is the need for human capital. So moving human capital across borders will be more challenging, more expensive. We've already seen things like visas being harder to come by. All of that will have an impact on profitability. And then We've also seen things such as deglobalization having leading to increased geopolitical tension, driving inflation, and increase in market volatility. All of things that our survey respondents felt were going to be exacerbated over the next five to ten years. That's certainly a, a theme that we we have heard over the last year or so, even from guests on this show. I mean, we had Peter Zion here early part of early sort of January 2023. Was obviously that's his. A topic he covers demographics, obviously, but also this deglobalization theme in his latest book there. And it was, it was shocking the the degree to which the U.S. in particular was sort of reindustrializing its economy. And uh, we had even even last last episode we were discussing uh, thematic ETFs, and they have a reshoring ETF that's being launched. So it's uh, there's enough of a theme there to see that yeah, definitely this is on investors' minds. Yeah, and I think that. You know, some of the other themes that we talk about in this report, I'll touch on technology in a moment, are enabling that shift toward domestic manufacturing as well. So 3D printing capabilities are reducing the labor costs for domestic manufacturers. And I think it's also going to, you know, AI and automation in general will have a pretty outsized impact in that area. So potentially the costs of offshoring are now being offset by technological innovation, which is being spurred by this decoupling of international economies. 
So just going back to the divergent world scenario, another area that we touch on is socioeconomic inequality. So obviously there's a distinct impact on access to capital and participation in investment markets and how those will have an impact on the overall health of the global economy. And so our respondents in the survey found that a significant number of them believe that there will be a moderate to severe negative impact on the overall health of the global economy due to increasing socioeconomic inequality. So it's something just as we consider the implications of our regulatory policies, of our political policies, factor keeping that those economic landscape in mind is important. Another diverging world's data point we have is around the demographic shifts. So we're anticipating, and you know, Mike, you were just talking about having a demographic discussion. You know, aging populations are going to continue to become more and more of a strain on society as we have lower net replacement rates, particularly in developed markets. We're likely to see things such as increased government debt and taxation, underfunded pensions, and reduced economic growth. So not exactly a rosy picture to paint there, but things to be considerate of as we look toward what the next five to 10 years looks like and we keep an eye on those replacement rate trends. And then finally, in the diverging world scenario, we also talk about the technology divide. So technology has enabled the democratization of finance, a topic and a talking point that many people have used over the last couple of years. But what it really means is that there's access to different investment products and investable assets that wasn't there before. So that includes things like access to private markets and the liquid assets through tokenization, all of which are spurned by blockchain technology backed products. Yeah, one of the uh, takeaways that I read in the report was young professionals should get up to speed on data science in addition to finance, which which gives us a good segue perhaps for the uh, the fourth theme that you guys worked on. Yeah, absolutely. The responses to the survey were pretty well aligned in that AI and big data technology skill sets are what is most in demand in the industry today. So certainly in the fourth scenario that we discussed, digital transformation, we highlight those needs. So things around the need for having human intelligence that can operate alongside artificial intelligence. We know that AI is going to have a big impact on how firms are positioning themselves for the future, their capabilities of meeting client needs. But there's also going to be a pretty significant drive towards sourcing and developing that human talent to go alongside our artificial companions. Another factor in the digital transformation space is digital assets and the increasing use and utilization of those, particularly in younger generation. Um, so we did recently did a study around Gen Z investors and 44% of Gen Z investors said that their first investment was in cryptocurrency. So as these investors continue to mature within the marketplace, perhaps their risk profiles will change and their investment behavior may change, but I don't necessarily see cryptocurrency and those digital assets completely going away over the next, in the medium term, let's say. So AI is uh, is obviously on top of mind for everybody. What One of the issues, I guess, that, that the report explores as well is just that there are barriers to that. So what, what's getting in the way of firms in, investing in or getting getting further along the line in AI, AI adoption? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think realistically, there are a few things that are creating those barriers. The first of which is the availability of talent pretty rare to have somebody who is both a finance expert and a technology or a coding or AI expert. So the pipeline for that type of talent is limited. Those, the people who have those skills are expensive and there just aren't very many of them. So applying these new technologies at scale is pretty challenging for that reason. I think another reason is people are concerned about the regulatory impacts. So we know that regulation is kind of a lag the advances of technology. So they're worried about investing a bunch of money in a product or a platform that eventually will be potentially in violation of a regulation that, that could be developed. And so I think there's some concern there. Yeah, and, and one maybe one point I would just add as well um, is just thinking about how do you build and optimize your 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 uh, 
internal organizational structure to be fit for purpose, to best capitalize on the, the, the skills and capabilities coming from new artificial intelligence and data science techniques. And so, you know, as Ryan alluded to, clearly talent and, and the relative shortage of talent in this area is one of the main constraints here. But getting the right balance of people that have complementary skill sets in both investments and in data science. And then that sort of small subsection of individuals that are fluent in, in both domains. That's really kind of having, having the, the right mixture of those professionals work, working together on project in a team is really central to what we believe will be needed to be successful um, in, in for the investment firms of the future. So yeah, it's as Ryan said, it's thinking about the, the talent and the skills mix, but then kind of optimizing your org structure to best capitalize on those capabilities. And I imagine firm culture would probably play a role in this too. Certain firms would be more open to adapting than others. Yeah, I think it's about having a culture of innovation, a culture of ethics as well. And so thinking about ethical development and deployment of new AI tools and techniques, uh, and and also having the, the client's interest first and foremost in your product development and and uh, innovation capabilities. So thinking about client needs, thinking about taking risks and innovating where appropriate, but staying within an ethical context. These are all important elements of a firm culture when it comes to technology developments. So Rodri, one of, one of the takeaways that came up a few times in the report was a rise in demand for personalized solutions for clients. And we touched on it briefly here earlier, whether that's new products or services, I, I'm not I'm not exactly sure. What, what do you think respondents meant, might have meant by that idea of personalized solutions? Yeah, I mean, so so if we look back to, again, the, the trends and sources of disruption that are driving this narrative, you know, we've talked about greater market segmentation and the need to then essentially to customize your offerings to cater to your different client segments across geographies, across markets. And personalization is one way in which you can do that. It's underpinned by advancements in technology that allow you to create greater range of products, greater range of more kind of bespoke and personalized products. And also that we think that there is growing demand for more personalized products. So I mean, particularly when you think about younger investors, their expectations, providing them with, with products and solutions that kind of meet not just their risk and return profile objectives, but also their values is something that firms are having to grapple with. So personalization can play out in a variety of ways. You know, some, some of the examples we cite in the report are, as I mentioned earlier, thematic investments. You know, that's, that's quite popular in the sustainable finance area where said providers can, can offer these, these custom portfolios that speak to a particular theme in the sustainability realm. And another one that we cite in the report is direct indexing. Um, this is actually, this has been cited as one of the biggest growth areas in the investment product area in the coming years, albeit from a pretty small base. Now, direct indexing really is the ability to create personalized portfolios held in a separately managed account that confers tax benefits on the individual uh, and that um, technology is used to kind of optimize that portfolio and manage it essentially like an index, but it's personalized to you as, as the individual. These are products that have been offered to kind of you know, the high net worth, ultra high net worth client base for some time. But with advancements in technology, reducing costs, we see these products becoming more accessible to the mass market investor. And that's really a growth opportunity is to, is to think about how you broaden access to these personalized product solutions to the mass market. And that's you know, a challenge and an opportunity. And as I said, it's underpinned by technology and just the broader kind of imperative of needing to take a more segmented approach to how you think about your client base and your markets that you're trying to serve. So as we mentioned earlier, this report was actually a follow-up to a similar survey report you published back in, in 2017. And we all know nothing much has happened since then. <laughs> what, what were the kind of the key differences that you saw in terms of investor outlook from that year versus 2023? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in for that one. So the key differences that we saw, there were really three different things. So one is the emergence of deglobalization, as we previously mentioned, and the role that geopolitics is playing in investment markets. So we're, see we're understanding that as governments are being more and more insular, 
it's really having an impact on how companies, firms, and investment organizations are able to interact with the markets. So I think that that really is driving a lot of the changes that we've seen. We've seen, you know, the I mentioned earlier, polarization. So polarization is kind of a subset of the deglobalization model as more and more countries become nationalistic. Thinking about, again, the emerging role of domestic manufacturing. So all those factors are kind of in play in the deglobalization and geopolitical space. Another key change from the 2017 report as Rodri was alluding to, is the role of inflation. So we kind of were lulled to sleep in the decade plus of low inflation rates. And now we're really seeing inflation having a role in the types of investment products and the demand for investment products that uh, individuals and firms have. So thinking about inflation protected investment opportunities, the role of active management reemerging to essentially take up some of that slack that was lost during the low inflationary period. We saw a tremendous push for passive investments over the last five to 10 years. And as rates have continued to go up since the COVID disruption, the opportunity for active management has somewhat reemerged. And we project that that will continue to, to hold true over that next five to 10 year period. And then the final thing is climate change. That's the final difference between the 2017 report and today. We've really started to see tangible impacts of climate change on investment behavior. And so I think that that we've gone from a a theoretical hope that we can work our way out of the situation that we had gotten ourselves into in regards to climate change and the environmental impact on our lived world. But I think that that is something that we're seeing really come to the forefront today as we think about uninsurability, infrastructure challenges as we consider things like sea level rise and global warming. So those are the three big factors that we've seen change since 2017, deglobalization, geopolitics, managing inflation, and climate change. Thanks for that. So we're, we're just coming to the end of our conversation, unfortunately, here, guys. Got our final question here. I'll ask you to maybe, because we've got two of you, maybe you can Briefly uh, respond each, if you could. I wonder what your first job in the industry was. And if you could go back and take yourself for coffee on your first day, what key piece of advice would you offer yourself? Uh, maybe, Ryan, what you, why don't you start us off? Sure. Perhaps I might have one of the more unique responses to this question. My first job in the investment industry was as a research manager for the Future Finance Initiative at CFA Institute. And I think if I was to go back in time and give myself a piece of advice, it would be to really just never stop learning. Take the time to invest in your personal education. Not, I don't necessarily mean uh, in an academic way, but um, read, insert, read your favorite periodical every day. Every day, try to take like little five minute segments to learn something new that you didn't know when you woke up that morning. I think that's how we all stay relevant, how we kind of build upon our successes of the past and how we can position ourselves to be better in the future. And uh, from my side, Mike, um, so I started out my career at uh, PwC in the investment funds group there and uh, took the CFA charter during my time at PwC. One advice would I give myself, I think it would be to travel, to work abroad. I think, you know, the opportunity to immerse yourself in a different custom culture just gives you a broader perspective and that broad perspective can really help you understand, you know, macroeconomic challenges, industry shifts, industry dynamics, as well as give you the experience to sort of manage and navigate a a global distributed workforce. So you travel and embrace opportunities to to work away from your home country would be uh, some advice that I would have given myself. Having spent a year in your part of the world, Rodri, I got to say, I totally agree with you. So thank you for that. I've been speaking today with Rodri Priest and Ryan Munson, the Senior Head of Research and Research Manager, respectively, for CFA Institute. You can find their report, The Future State of the Investment Industry, on the CFA website. Thanks so much for coming on the show today, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. One final note before I sign off, I'd like to take a second to ask that if you're enjoying the show, please take a moment to rate and share it. Those little stars really help the show reach more people, and we'd love to keep growing it.